Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us today, whether live or watching this video later. This is a sacred time as we gather in community to open our hearts to God. I invite you to light a candle wherever you are, as our candles are lit here in our sanctuary to remind us of God's presence with us and to set aside this as a time of worship for you. Our service will be in voice and text. Music will be on the media viewer, so be sure that you have media turned on. And there will be a link in nearby chat if you want to view the video in your own browser. I'm going to start our gathering music and run the rest of the announcements underneath. Our lectionary reading for today comes from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. And throughout this letter, Paul addresses elitist attitudes and divisive behavior by some of the church as they lined up behind different teachers, some behind Paul 
and some behind another teacher who came after Paul named Apollos. If we were to base our picture of Apollos only on this letter, we wouldn't know much. But Apollos also shows up in the book of Acts, where we learn that he was Jewish and from the metropolis of Alexander, which was the center of Jewish wisdom traditions. He was eloquent, well-grounded in Hebrew scripture, and an enthusiastic evangelist. In this era of email and texting and sound bites, where we condense communication down to even less than complete words, the letters from the Apostle Paul and others included in the New Testament can be somewhat daunting. It's hard to imagine the people of the Corinthian church gathered around listening to someone read the whole letter that is 1 Corinthians, especially since the letters were written to a culture very different from ours, with different norms and expectations, and they addressed specific questions and problems of the people of that day. Sometimes Paul's language is very intellectual and abstract, perhaps intended for the more educated or theologically adept of the community. But other times, like in the passage for today, he gets very concrete, using metaphors and images to give those reading and hearing his letters something tangible to hold on to, so they will understand his teaching. Paul has to do it all with words. It's a letter after all. And yet his images are very graphic and visual. I suspect that if he were preaching today, Paul would be very into sermon props and PowerPoint slides. He wants to be sure everyone understands, so he goes with the simple and the graphic. So let us listen to God speaking to us through the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'm sorry. Brothers and sisters, oh, finally, sorry. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. But after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord is assigned to each task. I planted the seed, Apollo watered it, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters it is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants the plant and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord, God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, and thank you, Joyce. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is one of my favorite passages from Paul's letters. And not just because of his graphic images. I mean, how many preachers today would have the nerve to get up and call out the people in their congregation for acting like big babies? He must have been pretty miffed. But then he calms down 
and switches metaphors. Instead of the nursery room, we're in the field or the vegetable garden. Paul planted seeds in that garden. Apollos watered them. But God has been making them grow. This is a beautiful image of God at work in the world. God has been making it grow. Oh, scientists can explain how it happens, how plants grow. You can read all about cell division and genetics and photosynthesis, how roots take up nutrients and how fungal networks connect plants underground to help that process. And unless you're a plant biologist, though, much of that work happens out of our sight, in the dark under the soil. And we're at a small scale, too small for human eyes. But God has been making it grow all the time, even when we couldn't see it. And the fact that it happens at all, that a small seed can grow into a big green leafy plant, that is miraculous and mysterious all on its own. If you garden, or tend house plants or culinary herbs on your windowsill, or if you look outside in the spring and notice daffodils popping up through the soil, or new green leaves sprouting on barren branches, you touch that miracle, that mystery. But Paul also talks about another way God works in the world, through God's servants, God's co-workers, those planting, those watering, those pruning and tending. We often quote Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which Christ walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which Christ blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are Christ's body, because Christ has no body now on earth but yours. So Paul, Apollos, you, me, God works through us in the world. And in my theology, I would say that the inspiration that leads us to plant in the first place and the choice of what seed to plant, where and when, the patience to wait for it to sprout and fruit in its season, to not give up on it, the perseverance to keep watering and tending it appropriately day after day, not neglecting it so it withers or overwatering it so the roots rot, and the knowledge of when the fruit is ripe enough to harvest, that all of these are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, says Paul, those who have those different gifts, those who plant and those who water, use those gifts to work together for one purpose, God's purpose. In the case of this letter from Paul, he's talking about God's purpose for the church at Corinth. And all those spiritual gifts are accessed through the spiritual practice of discernment. You may remember me talking before about the quintessential discernment question. What is mine to do? But discernment isn't just for individuals, it's for communities, which is the process we embarked on last Sunday for God's church gathered here at First UCC Second Life. If you weren't here last Sunday, there is a note card called Survey in the red binder with the bulletins. We would appreciate it if you would take one and consider the questions on it and return it by sharing it back to me or any of the staff when you can. It's an initial survey, taking the pulse of our church, if you will, to see what we are, where we are going as we enter this discernment process. But the last question in particular gets to what I want to talk about today. 
What does God long for from first UCCSL? Which is another way of saying what is God's purpose for us here at first UCCSL? Now, last week, some folks remarked to me how hard that question is. And someone asked me how we could possibly know what God longs for. And at other times, when I've talked about discernment, I've been asked what discernment means. Because the church, capital C, has largely forgotten our centuries-old tradition of discernment as a spiritual practice. The word has been co-opted in the secular culture to mean decision-making of any kind but they're not the same. Decision-making is grounded in logical thinking and debate. When we look at a question with that rational mindset, we look at pros and cons, we consider the available data, we use an orderly process of debate, nowadays typically Robert's rules of order, people advocate for or against a side, and then we take a vote which, if it's a split vote, results in winners and losers. Discernment is different because the goal isn't simple group agreement. It's tapping into the will and movement of the spirit. It's about listening deep inside for God's guidance. And it is usually best done in stillness as we quiet our inner selves to listen which is why I asked you to take some centering breaths before considering that last question. Ruth Haley Barton defines discernment as an ever-increasing capacity to see the work of God in the midst of the human situation so that we can align ourselves with whatever God is doing to throw yet another metaphor into the mix. Discernment is seeing which way God's train is moving so we can hitch ourselves to it. And when we discern as a community, we move beyond our own personal preferences to see what God is doing with the community as a whole. Both decision-making and discernment are good practices for church governance in different contexts, though it may take discernment to determine which process is appropriate at a given time. To use an example from a brick-and-mortar church context, if you need to decide, say if you need to decide which light bulbs to buy, is decision-making or discernment more appropriate? Hmm. Well, if the lights are out and no one can see, you just go buy the first available light bulb that will work in those fixtures. But if the question is, should we use LED lights because they are better for the environment, even though they are much more expensive and use more church resources, well, maybe discernment is the way to go looking at which choice is more in line with where the Spirit is leading that church to live in the world. Now, if the church has done the work to name where God is leading, then that would be simple. Well, if not, that process may take longer. I do know a church that spent an entire four-hour council meeting on which light bulbs to buy. There, the real question was, some of the council members were using a rational decision-making approach, and some were using a more discerning approach. So it helps to know the difference and know what to use at any given time. Discernment is a practice with deep roots in the Judeo-Christian scripture and tradition, even though the word itself doesn't appear often in the Bible. Consider, for example, the story in Acts 15, where the early church debates whether to require Gentile followers of Jesus to be circumcised and follow Jewish dietary laws. Paul and Barnabas bring this question to the church council, who pray and consider this matter 
until they can say with one unified voice, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to eliminate the burden of Jewish law on Gentile converts. Well, mostly. Together, the members of the early church discerned the leading of the Holy Spirit in that matter. The thing is, discernment as a spiritual practice, whether for us as individuals or for the community, confronts us directly with our own assumptions about how God works in the world and our experience of God. The Apostle Paul addresses this in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, the chapter right before today's reading. Discernment as a practice doesn't make much sense to those who believe God set the world in motion and then stepped back to watch humans figure things out on their own. That God isn't in, that God isn't involved in our world or in our decisions. That who can know the mind of God, to quote a familiar phrase from a different translation of that second chapter of Corinthians, which is usually taken out of context. Because what Paul goes on to say right after that is, who can? We can. We have access to God's thoughts through the Spirit, or by, in Paul's words, putting on the mind of Christ. I also meet people all the time who believe God is active in the world, but don't trust themselves to recognize the promptings of the Spirit. They second-guess what they know in their hearts. Discernment, listening for the Spirit speaking in us, it takes practice. And you can start by settling in and letting yourself still and by remembering. So I invite you to take a moment and reflect on what you believe about how God works in the world and what you have seen or experienced. Have you ever felt led by God to take some action, to make some change in your life? We are God's field, says Paul. What have you felt stirring in you deep in the ground, deep inside, what do you feel now? We'll pause for a moment to be still. All right, let's take a deep breath and consider another question. Can you think of a time that you would name as God at work in the world? Some time when seeds were planted. Someone who watered and tended what was growing. Try to think of a time. As we 
breathe and pause and remember and listen. Pay attention to how it feels. Notice what is rising inside you. What emotion, what feeling in your body. God is at work in the world and in us, as individuals and as a community. How do we align ourselves with God? What seeds need to be planted in and by First UCCSL? What needs to be watered, tended? What is growing here? What does God long for? from first to CCSL. We can know through the spirit, listening and discerning together. Who are you to know the mind of God? You are God's co-worker, Christ's eyes and hands and feet, filled with the spirit, connected to mystery. Discernment continues. We'll talk again. Amen. The chorus to this song is, this next song is one that I sang to my daughter when she was an infant, and that I sang today to my grandson. It's in every one of us to be wise. Find your heart, open up both your eyes. We can all know everything without any. It's in every one of us by and by. It's in every one of us to be wise. Find I've been realizing that both 
this ticket And I've been watching only half of the show Oh, but there is scenery and lights And the cast of thousands Who all know, all know what I know, what I know And it's good that it's so it's in every one of us to be wise. Find your heart. Open up. Open up. Open up. It's in every one of us By And now, if you have a prayer of joy or concern that you wish to lift to God and have supported by the energy of those gathered here, type it in your by chat at this time. And as people pray their, share their prayers in text, please read them prayerfully and hold this space as sacred and safe to open our hearts to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'll start today with prayers of gratitude for all the prayers uh, that have been lifted up for my family and our dog Lana, who we did say goodbye to this Wednesday. But prayer, it works, because her passing was as peaceful as it could have been on a beautiful day, laying outside in the sun. So we are grateful for that and for her life and the love that she gave us. So, God of grace, hear that prayer. I would also like to lift up prayers for the tens of thousands who have perished in the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. And the many, yes, here we go. And for the survivors and for those who are in the rescue teams. For, as Joya says, the people of Turkey and Syria as they recover from that just amazingly powerful earth movement. Oh, God of grace, hear our prayer. Uh, yes, for all those suffering from the cold, and there's a new wave passing through, I see, especially our unhoused neighbors. May they find shelter in the storm, and warm hearts to bring them in. The God of grace, hear our prayers.
Thanks for the joyous prayers of thanksgiving for people surrounding me with their love. Amen. And let us take this moment to breathe out love for you, joyous, for we surround you as well. May God of grace hear our prayers. And thank you, Monica, prayers for discernment for First UCC Church of Second Life. Amen. Lord, hear our prayers. Those voiced here today, those spoken only in the depths of our hearts, those for which we have no words, we lift them all to you, O Lord, with faith in your boundless love and grace. And we pray together the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our worship is over. Our ministry to the world is just beginning. Go in peace, come again in hope, and amen. And thank you, Joyce, for that link. I will, uh, I will hit it to make sure, to see which one it is and make a note that you particularly like it. This is a, a group that I found in the process of doing these services. I've used this this music before, and I really love this group. been a long time running I never knew then what I know I know now that the fruits they always come in but you can't go around just knocking them down it takes a long time to show in we plant the seeds then and we look at them now but the roots are always growing no matter if I'm there or never around Whatever grows will grow, whatever dies will die, whatever works will work, whatever flies will fly, whatever fails will fail, what's meant to soar will soar. I am planting seeds, nothing It's more. like your whole life. You've been training for this moment and when the time comes you just disown it Meaning you just surrender, don't control it Not interested in the clay pots and mold it Or sitting next to the path trying to unfold it Or waiting for the fruits to fall down toward you Let it go and now you're flowing feeling quite gorgeous So you take steps away instead of towards it What a rush feeling freedom with nothing to hold We've been taught that what you touch will always turn to gold And now we're learning when we let it go it overflows With no credit to take cause no credit is home A higher power working deeper where the seed are sold and when the seeds are true then they're seeds of gold but the real gold is joy when life starts to flow and when it does you just smile cause now you know i spent a long time running i never knew then what i know i know now let the fruits they always come in but you can't go around just knocking them down it takes a long time to show in we plant the seeds then and we look at them now but the roots are always growing no matter if i'm there or never around Whatever grows will grow, whatever dies will die, whatever works will work, whatever flies will fly, whatever fails will fail, what's meant to soar will soar. I am planting seeds. Whatever grows, yep. when it grows, it grows. Whatever dies, when, 
when it dies, it dies. Come on. Works, if it works, it works. Whatever flies, will let it fly, let it fly. Fails, will fail. When it fails, it fails. Come on, it soars, it soars. I am planting seeds. Whatever grows, will grow. Let it grow, let it Whatever grow. Whatever dies, will die. When it dies, it dies. Whatever works, will grow. Come on, it works, it works. Whatever flies, yeah. will fly. Let it fly, let it Whatever fly. Whatever fails, will fail. If it fails, it fails. It soars. Nothing more. Nothing more.